are you? Nice to see you. You too. You too. Thanks for getting me on the uh, the show here. Definitely. So we got Craig Henry uh, from Siemens. Siemens. Right. Yes. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you're doing here. What I'm doing here at the show? <laughs> yeah. What well, is Siemens doing at a supply chain show? Well, see, that is a little, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I got introduced to CSCMP about two years ago, maybe three years ago. A buddy of mine said, you need to come at this thing. I'm like, well, that's, that seems like more of a logistics show, which is you mm. know, over the road trucking and, yeah. you know, packaging and, and tracking and software. And, but no, uh, the supply chain actually goes right down into the warehouse itself. You know? Yeah. So I can ask you the same thing. What are you doing here? But you are part of that supply chain just like I am. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, so Siemens is all about uh, the technologies behind. We're a second layer to the end customer. Mm -hmm. So we're we're going to supply the the integrators and, and builders of equipment and conveyor systems and robotic uh, control cabinets, etc. We also provide right. the tools for emulation and simulation for all that stuff. Yeah. And we're we're from the shop floor all the way up into the cloud. Mm -hmm. We are uh, we have a great offering as well in in. Uh, switches manage switches and and uh, we're moving quickly toward a a statement based language control system mm, um, which is classically a lot of the control systems that we work on and do are for um, a PLC a, a kind right. of box that has a very specific operating system does a very specific job and uh, we're seeing some movement now which is something that's been talked about for 40 years yeah but Oh, everything's gonna be on a PC. Well, everything's not gonna be on a PC, but mm. there are some some functions that I'm seeing uh, at the high level that are moving that way, and Siemens is is paving the way for that, yeah. and, and that's also kind of cool. So, but more to the point, this uh, the supply chain includes how you're moving product within right. the walls yeah. of an organization, and Absolutely. that's that's really where I uh, why I'm here. And I've got uh, customers here, and mm. you know we're we're having meetings and talking about how can we make things more not necessarily optimized, but right. uh, providing optionality and agility within mm. the walls of the of the facility. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's interesting that you just mentioned like not necessarily optimizing, but putting the agility in place, right? So tell us a little bit about I mean when you look at intra logistics within the four walls, right, which you guys are focused on, so. I mean, that agility, give us an example of something that would be fall into that agility category. Like if I'm a, if I'm a shipper and I have a few warehouses mm -hmm. and I'm looking at a situation, like where would that agility come into play to, to help me out? Well, the, the thing is, we know that demand is, is uncertain by its nature. It right. will never yes. be certain. You're not going to have a set number of orders coming in on certain days that you're going to have fulfilled. Mm. The and often we're seeing now with the churn of business is you're going to have a lot of change in the kind of material that's going to be in your warehouse. And if yeah. you're a 3PL, that's the name of the game. It's going to be yeah. not just the same stuff, not every day. So agility is more about how your facility is going to be able to flex and change, mm -hmm. even though it's a fixed thing. Yeah, you have to have the ability to handle a higher volume. You have to be able to high, uh, be able to handle different size mm -hmm. loads unit loads and, and tote base loads or whatever you're doing. And so when you put into into place systems like mm. AMRs or ASRS systems yeah. or, you know, and, and even conveyors too, mm. but there, there are a lot of technologies that can, that can give you that. Mm. The biggest one, however, is going to be the software tools. Right. Because the software tools, the more you can move out of a hardware-based thinking and into a software-based thinking, Mm. For example, classically, and even today, people will design and build mm. components, gantries, and robot cells and stuff, right. and see how it works. Yeah. And that sounds fine. That's how you do it, right? No. <laughs> you should design it in software. Yeah. You should work it in software. The tools have been around for a while. Mm. You can even run the code that you're going to run on those systems to see if it's going to run fast enough, and mm. et cetera. And I mean fast enough, like, are your networks fast enough? Yeah. And make sure it works and then start getting the, the iron, the steel, the motors and all mm. the things you have to have to make that work. That is a key. Mm. And so having the software model or digital twin of right. what you're doing, if you can do that, you're going to be way ahead. And then when you implement, it's going to go a lot more quickly. You have less mm. surprises because integrators are telling me they spend 70 percent of their resources once they get on site. Oh, After they've yeah. designed it all, they got bought all the parts, done all that yeah, stuff, yeah. done some testing. Then they have to break it all down, put it on site, and then right. solve all those interconnection problems. Right. Ideally, you'd love to have a digital twin of your whole facility. Mm. 
that's going to become a norm. It's still very rare, believe it or not, today. Yeah. So that's the that's the long answer to that question, but that's a key question. Yeah. So I'm curious on that. I mean, why is it still very rare to have the digital twin? I mean, obviously there's a, a it's, huge it's a question of faith. Yeah. Because you, it's not free. Yeah. If I say to you, hey, why don't you have a digital twin of everything? Okay. What does that require? Yeah. Well, you have to have an expensive engineer mm. um, or hire some people at high rates yeah. to develop that twin, and then you have to have someone manage it over time, and it mm. takes there's an upfront cost to put that in place. Yeah. But the return on investment is very good because you're going to start discovering things that you didn't know because mm. you don't know what you don't know. And right. as you do this stuff in software, you'll realize there's opportunities to scale or to change or to, to mm. solve some problems that you didn't were going were to happen. So you're going to have a return on investment. So the reason there, it's a barrier to entry is the short answer. Yes. Yeah. If you have that barrier to entry of, well, oh, I have to spend a quarter of a million dollars right now to yeah. get this thing going. Mm, let's just build it. You know, I think that's yeah, been yeah. the philosophy. But the more forward okay. thinking folks are going, nope, we're going to we're going to we're going to do this in the kind of the metaverse and then yeah. get it into the real universe. Hmm. Interesting. And do you find that uh, more companies are asking about digital twins and trying to figure out how do they Absolutely. fit that into their operations? Yeah, I, I'm working with one now who three years ago, they were like, yeah, 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 whatever. Hmm. But as what was it? The Chinese proverb says, yeah. when the student is if pupil is ready, master appear. You know, that's how <laughs> that's supposed to work. And I think now we're, yeah. we're like, now you're ready to hear the same thing we've been telling you three years ago. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, show me those tools because they're getting tired of implementations taking too long mm. and things changing so quickly or yeah. doing an implementation, discovering mm, we could have done it differently, scrapping the project. A year has gone by. They've yeah. missed it. They spent all this money. They could have done it a lot differently and spent that money better. Mm. It's not always that easy. In hindsight, it's 2020. I get that. But yeah, yeah I think that we're moving more into a, a into the, the science fiction realm that will yeah. become science reality shortly. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's such an interesting thing. And like you said, I mean, you see the benefit from the digital twin because, you know, you're able to, to see things before you actually have to physically do it. Right. And when you physically do something, you know, like you said, you end up with a lot of waste potentially or you end up with something that's by the time you're done, it's already needs to be upgraded. Right. In some cases. So. So, I mean, it's really, I think, important to start to embrace this technology. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, you know, as you look at, especially something that's changing as often as you, you mentioned a 3PL in there, right? Your, your clients can be, can be changing a lot. Their product mix can be mm -hmm. changing, right? As companies grow yep. that you're working with, they have more inventory, they have more products, mm -hmm. more SKU assortments, more packs that they do or bundles, whatever the case is. And, if you're not able to, to kind of adopt around, uh, around that or adapt around that and be able to understand that uh, without, you know, making all these physical changes and mm -hmm. just, you know, uh, kind of like, is this going to work? Is it not going to work? Just move stuff around. I mean, you can eat a lot of cost in that, that sense, right? So mm -hmm. digital twin can really help you to do yeah. that. So, sure. I, I mean, talk to us a little bit about maybe some... Uh, it's like success stories with digital twins where companies have been able to leverage the digital twin to, to make smarter decisions and, and really benefit them in the, the long run. Yeah, well, the digital twin really does pay for itself. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I know there are some listeners and some people in this field who are mm -hmm. aware that we all get excited about technology. Yeah. You know, like lasers on shark's heads. It's freaking awesome. That's yeah, not. Yeah. I can't wait for I'm that to be about. widespread. Yeah. yeah that's, <laughs> stick with me. Um, yeah. But I think everything has to hold up. Hmm. Everything has to hold up. And the thing about the digital twin <clears throat> is that you can put in human beings into that model. Hmm. You can change the temperature in the place and see how that affects things. Yeah. Uh, you can understand your power consumption. That all can be digitally done. Mm. So you get a lot of benefits, by the way. Yeah. Success stories. Well, we're finding with, with a number of customers that we've worked with, the huge return on investment is when you go to implement, you're going to implement 60% mm. less time and money yeah. because you've done this work ahead of time. Mm. And what's true in product development is true with any project management is if you have a fuzzy front end, you're not, gonna, you're not really going to get what you really think you're going to get. You're going to yeah. do a lot of assumptions. So if you have a really clear concept of what you're going to build, you've done some analysis up front, mm -hmm. you know what the edges are, you know what the seasonality changes and the standard deviations of demand and all that. Mm -hmm. that you've done all that math. When you go to implement, you're ready. Mm -hmm. You're not going to find out all these things that are oops and very expensive and changing your schedule. So I think yeah. that's where 
that happens. Um, I think there are there are a number of companies we've worked with. The benefit comes from the technology, but it first comes from having just doing the basics really, really well, which yeah. is do your industrial engineering, folks. Mm -hmm. Figure out what you want to do, where you want to save, because the problem of, of intro logistics is is multifaceted depending on what your goal is. Is your goal to make the most profit? Yeah. Is your goal to have the best customer service? Mm. Those go against each other. Yeah. Is it to have the fastest throughput? Is it to have the least number of people? Mm. All those factors, you can't have everything. So you have to decide what you want. Yeah. Uh, they do that with cars, by the way, the design of cars. Mm -hmm. They'll design the Honda Accord or something. They'll say, mm. of all of these different feature sets, we want a seat that is a seven out of 10. We want yeah. a steering wheel that's a five out of 10. We want a, you know, whatever. Mm. They, they put all these categories and that designs the car, mm. just like designing a, a, a facility. I uh, worked with DigiKey yeah. up in Minnesota. They are a privately held $5 billion company mm. that is still privately held and they put in a gigantic ASRS system. Yes. And yeah. it pays for itself because they're going from 28,000 shipments every single day to mm. 50,000. Wow. And now that they put this thing in, they're already designing the, the expansion of it because they see mm. that they can gain market share yeah. because of that technology. Yeah. That's a huge investment. It was close to $300 million, I think, to get all that stuff in and it wow. took years. But yeah. it is a fundamental change in their business and they are a leader mm. worldwide now, I think, yeah. uh, but certainly in the United States. So you have to do your math though. Mm. There should be a return on investment. Yes, yeah. But everyone has to automate because of the labor shortage. Mm. Long answer to your question, I kind of danced around it, but no, no, the labor good. shortage is forcing automation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's, you know, it's inevitable. Um, and I think it's it's at that point too, and I'm curious like what you see, because I think it's at the point where we've, you know, the larger companies, right, have started automation already. They're putting robotics in place and all these different things. Um, but it's at the point where that, that small to medium sized shipper as well is like, I need to get some automation, right? I mean, are, are you seeing that in the market where it's basically at a point if you're not automating, like you're not gonna survive? You know, I don't know if I can emphatically say yeah. if you have a manual, smaller, with maybe a not a, not a lot of SKUs kind of um, fulfillment center that you're doomed. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know that that's the case, but I think that the more you can move into the digital world Mm. the more you can flex with your growth and your changes. Yeah. And I think it's kind of a field of dreams. You can you know, build it and they will come. I think you right. can, as a 3PL, for example, mm. attract a lot of your market by having that automation. Mm. Like it's, yeah. it's a lot easier to scale something in software and with, with these, uh, these uh, automation tools than it is to say, let me get Bob and Mary and Jim and now, now I have seven of them. Now I have ten of them. Now I have twenty of them. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not going to go that way. And and yeah, the talent is a real problem. There's a talent gap here. Yeah. So I wouldn't say emphatically, no, everyone's doomed who's not automating. I would say smart automate. Mm. Consider where you're. Like I said, what are you trying to optimize? Yeah. You know, if if you can be medium or small and be wildly profitable, mm. do you want to grow? Maybe leave it alone. Maybe cherry pick the market you want do just that you know? yeah or if you're trying to be the you know the the, the amazon walmart whatever anything right. goes yeah yeah well that's gonna be challenging and uh, you probably will need to automate to, to keep up with that yeah that marketplace yeah absolutely and I, I think it's really interesting insights there and it's definitely great to, to understand that and, and i think the the digital twin aspect of that too i mean you know if you're looking at and you know maybe uh you've convinced some people here to to invest in digital twin right i mean at least look at it yeah yeah, yeah. but what, i mean what's like foundationally if i were to say like okay i want to bring a digital twin uh technology into to my organization mm -hmm. um i mean what do you really have to do to to be at that that point of, of preparation and lay the foundation because there's a lot of a lot of data there that's, that's happening yeah, it could be daunting but it's really not that tough you can get a point cloud or a point scan of your c current facility mm -hmm. which gets it down to the centimeter even smaller yeah within half an hour you've got a whole mm. lidar point cloud of your facility you bring yeah. that into a software tool that you get for free as a free download you can play mm -hmm. with it for a while and bring it in and then add functionality to what's going on there and say well we're gonna add functionality to how the material flows like this, mm. and let's now draw in with another tool. Let's draw in another yeah. um, conveyor system or 
mm. increase the number of robots we have or add people in and start seeing how they function. And those software tools are available. Now they're yeah. pretty sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So there's costs for licensing and that kind of thing. So there's gonna be a point where you're gonna have to get into it. But there may be some entry level tools that I'm not aware of too that you can do yeah. that. But the point cloud is where you start. Mm. And it is surprisingly uh, accurate. Yeah. And there are companies actually putting um, LiDAR sensors up like in the ceiling yeah. and, and every week or every so often they're doing another scan because things are changing on the floor yeah, and whatever and they, yeah. it, it becomes old. They don't want to, you know, have old information. Yeah. They want to know what's really going on. Yeah, real time. And, and LiDAR is particularly cool because it doesn't have to have light. Mm. It's going to give you everything. It could be complete darkness and it's going to scan everything and see it. Yeah. yeah. But Google does when it's scanning your house when it's driving down the street and you're yeah, looking yeah. at the, 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 the street view, yeah. that's all LIDAR. It's yeah. not, it's not um, you know, just video. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's where I would start. All right, cool. So very interesting stuff with you, Craig, as always, and, and always great insights. And, and I know you love the, the digital twins. You're, you're the digital twin himself, that, right, on LinkedIn. Oh, I am the digital twin. Yes, yeah, That's yeah. right, that is my handle, isn't it? Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my so, problem will be when the digital twin makes me obsolete. That's going to be an issue. Yeah, I'll yeah. be off in the corner. No, be like the Matrix. No, I'll be like in some goo. No, we, in the we, lo position. we love the real Craig. We love <laughs> okay, the real Craig. Yeah, we don't want the digital twin. So, so always a pleasure to talk to you and, and get these insights uh, from the industry from you as well. Uh, so thank you for stopping by and thanks for uh, talking no, to us. No, thanks today. for letting me do yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Great to see you. We'll see you too.